right, now we're going to cover chapter 13. We're going to focus in on uh, viruses, viroids, and purons here. Um, when you're looking here at the viruses, viruses are considered acellular, non-living particles. So we talked about um, back in chapter 4, prokaryotic cells, which are cells without a nucleus and organelles. In chapter 12, we hit on eukaryotic cells, which have um, a nucleus and organelles. And now we're going to go to something that's considered acellular, no cell. Okay, because of this, these guys are obligate intracellular parasites, meaning they have to gain access into a cell in order to reproduce. All right, so they have to hijack or commandeer the the cell in order to make more viruses. Now, this is an issue because they're not alive, but they do need an alive or active host in order to be activated, um, and they can cause infection. The word virus is Latin for poison. So let's look at some basic viral structures that are here. When we look at a virus, a virus is always going to have an internal nucleic acid core. This nucleic acid core could either be DNA or RNA. Another thing to note that is it could be a double-stranded DNA, it could be double-stranded RNA, it could be single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA. It has lots of variations of either having that DNA or RNA molecule. Now one thing to note though too is that it only has one type. It does not have DNA and RNA, okay? It has one or the other. Now, this inner core is going to be protected around with a outer protein capsid. These capsids can have different kind of shapes to them. Um, they can um, be very complex. They could be spherical. They could be a rod. There's lots of different ways that they can have this capsid. And then some of these viruses also have an envelope. The envelope is optional, but an envelope does offer protection for the virus. Just like an envelope does for your, for your letters, it makes it where it's hard for you to see what's inside of it. This envelope offers protection for the virus to hide from your immune system. So let's do a quick comparison of viruses versus bacteria. So when we look here, um, a bacteria has a cellular organization because it does have cells. Viruses do not. Bacteria also do metabolism. They are able to create ATP and do chemical reactions. Again, viruses cannot. Bacteria can respond to its environment. Back, viruses cannot. And so when we look at here, this is what makes bacteria living versus viruses non-living. Another thing though is that they can replicate. Bacteria replicates through binary fission, whereas viruses are going to replicate only within a host cell, whether that host is a bacteria, plant, animal, a protist, fungus, but it has to gain access into a cell. Bacteria can also mutate. Because it mutates, it can make changes, which makes it hard for us to potentially treat with antibiotics and things like that. Viruses also have the ability to mutate. Um, this makes it difficult to develop effective vaccines against viruses and be able to protect against them. Um, when we're looking at bacteria, the, because it is, a, it is a made up of a cell, it is going to have a plasma membrane. It is going to have ribosomes. It doesn't have the other organelles, but it does have ribosomes. It has DNA and RNA. When we look at the virus, the virus does not have a plasma membrane, it does not have organelles at all, and it's either going to have DNA or RNA, not both. When we look at bacteria, it talks about if they're filterable, size dependent. Um, no, they're not when we look at this, but viruses are because they are so small. They're way smaller than bacteria are. And then bacteria are sensitive to antibiotics. However, viruses are not. Viruses are gonna be more sensitive to interferons. All right, so there's different chemicals that bacteria are going to be sensitive to versus viruses. So let's look at the general morphology of a virus. There are different types of viruses. There can be what we call helical viruses. When you're when you're looking at helical viruses, helical viruses are long rods. Um, they can either be rigid or flexible. All right, so some examples of some helical viruses are things like rabies, Ebola, um, hemorrhagic fever. Um, so these are just some examples of some viruses that are helical. We also see that some are what we call polyhedral viruses. Now polyhedral viruses, they're gonna have like 20 sides to them, all right? So they look like a sphere, but they actually are a combination of lots of like small triangles kind of put together. So some examples of these are adenovirus. Adenovirus is the virus that causes a common cold, and then poliovirus. Um, some viruses are enveloped. If they are helical enveloped viruses, this is gonna have that helical structure with an envelope around it. That's what you can see here with D. This is going to be like influenza, which which causes the flu. Um, we also have some envelope polyhedral examples here. This is going to be like herpes simplex. So it has a polyhedral structure, but it's inside of an envelope. 
There's also some other complex viruses. These complex viruses include pox virus and bacteriophages, and this just means these viruses are more complex with their structure. Um, bacteriophages are really unique because bacteriophages are the ones who infect they infect bacteria. So if you look here at this picture, you have the pox virus. And then over here, this guy is the bacteriophage. If you've ever seen Toy Story, the first one, when uh, Woody gets stuck in Sid's room and all the toys come out that have been like mashed together, this reminds me of the one that crawls out from under the bed with all the legs and the doll's head. That's what this one looks like. It's a pretty scary type of virus. However, this one is going to infect bacteria, not us. Now with viruses, we do not use the normal taxonomy that we use for bacteria bacteria and plants and animals because these guys are considered non-living, but they are grouped by their type of nucleic acid, whether they're a DNA virus or an RNA virus. They're also going to be um, classified by their morphology. Um, what do they look like? Are they helical? Are they polyhedral? Are they enveloped? Um, that's the next one, presence or absence of an envelope. And then also their host range. Who can they infect? What are the types of cells that they can infect? This is their niche. Most viruses are very specific on who they will infect. So when we look at this, we have the uh, genre. This is going to be the name suffix of the virus. And so example here would be norovirus denotes a viral uh uh, genre. We also see we have the family name suff suffix, which is viridae. So you have the Calisiviridae denotes a viral family. So we can see that we can use some terms to help put these into groups. There is a table, 13.2 in your textbook, that talks about these host niches or ranges of viruses. So since viruses are non-living, it does make us, it makes it a lot harder for us to um, study them in a lab, all right? And so because of this, if we want to culture them and cultivate them to grow, it is going to take a few more steps to do this. So cultivation of bacteriophages, remember bacteriophages are the ones who actually infect bacteria, we can use a plaque method for this, okay? With the plaque method, you use a nutrient auger, you then take a bacterial, you um, do a bacterial spread plate. A spread plate is where you take it and you culture bacteria around the whole surface so the whole surface is covered in bacteria it allows the bacteria to grow then you're going to add a thin layer of liquefied auger this liquefied auger is going to contain the bacteriophage it's going to contain the virus okay then we're going to incubate it it allows the bacteriophage to infect the bacteria it then can start to replicate and kill off the bacteria and this creates a clearing these clearings are known as plaques this is where we would then count the plaque forming units so you could count how many there each of these these areas here where there is a clearing it would be representing one bacteriophage now this method is pretty easy because it does allow us to be able to grow bacteria quickly and get results quickly but if the virus does not infect a bacteria this creates a little bit harder um, opportunity to cultivate it so there are some animal virus cultivations that we can use um, we can put them into living animals when you put it into living animals of course it's going to end up potentially making the animal sick uh, but it allows us to look at the signs and symptoms that go along with it we also can um, inject them in embryonated eggs, meaning that the eggs have started that development process. So there's several layers of tissue. This will let us know what where the viruses prefer to replicate, what types of cells. We also see that we can um, do some cell cultures. When we do the cell cultures, they're going, we're going to look for what we call cytopathic effects or CPEs. Um, this is going to be where we're going to see where those cells have been affected. Cell deterioration. Now, one thing we can do is we can do a serological ID, um, ID um, of viruses, and these can be very specific and let us be able to tell what virus is present. If you've had the flu or you've been tested for the flu, this is like what they do. So they take the swab, they place it in your nose and collect a sample. On the swab, if the virus is present, there will be virus antigens there. They then add several drops of a liquid. These, this liquid contains antibodies. The antibodies, if they come in contact with the antigen, are going to react and it normally causes a color change. This is why they can then tell you pretty quickly in the clinic if you have the flu and even if you are positive for type A or type B because these antibodies are going to be very specific to that specific virus. Another thing we want to look at is the viral multiplication process. How do we get more viruses? Now remember these viruses have to invade a host cell. When they invade the host cell they commandeer the host's metabolic activity. So what they do is it's almost like they hijack the cell. They tell the cell you're no longer going to perform your normal functions and you are now going to make more of me which is 
the virus. All right, so they're going to make more of this. If you, another movie reference is if you've seen the Pirates of the Caribbean, Jack Sparrow is always commandeering or taking over ships. He then uses the ship for his purpose. This is what the virus is doing. It's taking over the cell and it's causing the cell to make more viruses. A single viron is capable of producing thousands of more thousand more viruses. All right, so it can end up multiplying very very quickly. Now there are two main cycles or ways that the virus can accomplish this goal. The first is called the lytic cycle. Now the lytic cycle has five main steps to it. So let's take a look at these really quick. And this is found in your textbook. So if we take a look here, the virus first has to attach to the cell. This is the attachment phase. This is where in this case, the bacteriophage attaches to the cell. Once it attaches to the cell, it now has to get its DNA or RNA, its nucleic acid, into the cell. This is called penetration. So it's going to do penetration, allowing its nucleic acid into the cell. Once inside of the cell, it's going to start what we call biosynthesis. This is where it's going to hijack this is where it's going to hijack the machinery of the cell. It's going to use the ribosomes and those structures to make more pieces of the virus. Okay, so it's going to synthesize the viral components, the capsid, more DNA or RNA, and all of those structures. Once all the structures are formed, it goes to step four, which is the maturation. This is where we're going to put all the pieces together. The viruses now are going to be mature and ready to be released. Okay, this is the last step. The last step is where they release all of the viruses. Now these viruses can go and infect other cells. All right. And so in this case, a lot of times when we look at the release, it is going to rupture or kill this host cell that it was originally a part of. So this is the lytic cycle. The lysogenic cycle has the same steps as the lytic cycle. However, there's a pause in here. So we first see attachment that takes place and then penetration, just like we saw with the lytic cycle. However, after penetration, we see a new step. This step is called integration. So this is where the viral nucleic acid is going to be incorporated or integrated into the host cells genome into their chromosomes. All right. This is where it's going to sit dormant. It's going to sit there a while and it's not going to really do anything. Once it gets triggered, whatever the trigger is, the stress or whatever, it's going to initiate the lytic cycle. This is going to cause the nucleic acid piece to come out and start the rest of the process we saw with the lytic cycle. It's going to cause biosynthesis where we're going to make viral parts. We're going to see maturation where we put all the parts together and then we do see release as well. All right. And so in this case, though, it can sit dormant for a long period of time in the lysogenic cycle. The lysogenic cycle does cause us a potential issue. Instead of in the lytic cycle, one cell being infective and infected and then producing thousands of viruses, we see this cell goes into this dormant stage. It divides normally and makes more and more cells. And in this case, it made four cells. Then the stress came in and each of these four cells now is producing thousands of viruses. So the infection can be exacerbated very quickly in a lysogenic cycle. Also, guys, if you'll notice here in this PowerPoint, you can click on these links in um, Canvas um, when you pull the PowerPoint up as the PDF, and you can watch these YouTube clips that really show you the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle in more detail. Now, some viruses are also a little more complex in the fact that they are what we call retroviruses. Retroviruses are the ones who have the RNA as their nucleic acid. So they have attachment, they have penetration, but then they also have to go through the process of going from RNA to DNA. To do this, they have to use a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase. This allows them to go backwards, okay? We normally see transcription where we go DNA to RNA, but in this case, we're going backwards. After that, we see it enters into the lysogenic cycle for integration. Okay, it'll then stay there until stress, some sort of trigger happens, then biosynthesis, maturation, and release will occur. Some other things that happen here, and in this case it's showing you like the HIV virus, when release happens here it buds out, off, and it takes some of your plasma membrane with it. When it does that, it now has the envelope, and it can hide from your immune system because it looks like you. It has an envelope from your cells. This makes it harder for your immune system to overcome it and it also does not kill the host cell to begin with okay so this is looking at the replication of a retrovirus again if you'll notice in this PowerPoint in canvas you can also watch this YouTube clip that really focuses in on a how the retrovirus replication works 
This chart's found in your textbook. It shows you the stages and what happens um, in each stage. It shows you the difference between the bacteriophage and the animal virus. Now guys, viruses a lot of times are linked to some types of cancers. Um, this is due to the process of transduction. Um, it's the transfer of DNA from one cell to another by the use of a bacteriophage. Um, this may result in cellular transformations. It causes your own DNA to start to change, okay, to um, have a transformation to it. This can convert some special pieces of our DNA that we actually have that are called proto-oncogenes into oncogenes, meaning that they are precursor cancer genes and then they get turned turned into the cancer genes. Another mutation that can be a problem is if the mutation is in our tumor suppressor genes. This causes um, these genes to be turned off and so tumors are not suppressed anymore and your cells will start dividing uncontrollably. Um, some DNA onco um, oncogenic viruses are things like HPV, Epstein-Barr or EB virus, and hepatitis B. Some RNA oncogenic, these are viruses that can actually trigger T-cell leukemias and lymphoma. All right, so when we're looking at this, this is in your textbook and it shows you kind of how an infection, a viral infection works. Um, most of the time, viral infections are very acute, meaning that they are short term, um, they peak and then they eventually will die out and that's it. And you see that here in the red. All right, so infection takes place, we see the, infe the acute infection happens, it increases on the chart and then it starts to decrease. However, there are some viruses that actually are more persistent. These are called persistent infections, where the first infection takes place and then it starts to go down but then over the months and years we start to see that it still will start to increase and cause a problem these are things like hpv hiv and hbv on the other hand other infections are considered latent infections so you, once you have them you, they then sit latent or dormant in your body so then stressors or something can trigger an infection to come up later infections some examples are things like cold sores uh, genital herpes and shingles Some other terms we need to look at are things called virons. Virons are um, found with animals, plants, and bacteria, and this is a complete virus. Um, this is the protein capsid with its nucleic acid core. However, we also have what we call a viroid. Viroids are found in plants, and these are infectious RNA particles. So it's not a complete virus. It doesn't have the capsid. It doesn't have a lot of nucleic acid to it. It just has some RNA. It is also known as a puron. Purons um, are found within animals. Um, these are protein, proteinaceous infectious particles.